Do you know what an extreme sport is? You know, extremes, I mean, they're, they're sports, football, basketball, track, those kinds of things. But uh, an extreme sport is often a solo sport. Now, there are a few of them that are done as teams. For instance, whitewater rafting sometimes is done as a team sport. But extreme sports are very high on danger. For instance, base jumping, where you just jump off of a tall building. Or as one Russian did, jump off a high cliff on Mount Everest. In fact, there was an argument a few years ago about whether or not bungee jumping qualified as an extreme sport. I always thought that was a very interesting thing to do, to tie a rubber band to your bottom and jump off something. Just excites me to think about it. No one's ever offered me the opportunity, but but they were arguing about whether or not that qualified as an extreme sport. And, And the compromise came, said, if you do your own measuring so that there's a real risk that you'll bump your noggin on the ground if you don't measure right. And only in that case could bungee jumping be regarded as an extreme sport. There are those who, who board uh, on extremely high waves, hurricane-style waves, and various other things. Well, I want to talk to you today about an act of extreme thanksgiving that sometimes is not seen as thanksgiving, but it actually occurred at a Thanksgiving meal. You probably didn't know that, but I invite you today to the first passage in which it's contained. It's actually found in three. It's in Matthew 26, and I invite you there uh, to be with me for a few moments in Matthew 26 and verse 6. You can also find this in Mark 14, beginning at verse 3, and in John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 1. What's interesting is that we're not given the full details until John's gospel. We're not given names, for instance, until John's gospel. Everyone in this story, their lives were in danger at the time that Matthew and Mark wrote their gospels. But John writes much later. And so the gospel of John actually gives us details that are not recorded in Matthew and Mark. Let's look at the text, verse 6 of Matthew 26. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price, And the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And then I'll not read it, but note that immediately following here and in Mark's gospel is Judas's act of betrayal as he goes and asks what price he would be given to betray the Lord Jesus. And the price is settled at 30 pieces of silver. This particular passage of Scripture is a Thanksgiving meal. Now let me explain to you why. You need to understand when you look at Mark's account and then John's account that the setting is immediately after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And the woman in the story who is anointing Jesus is Mary, the the sister of Lazarus and, of course, Martha. And you know that Lazarus also is there from John's account. And so this is a very interesting gathering. Here is one who has been dead for four days in their midst. And everybody's looking at him, and they just can't believe he's there. I mean, if you really dig into John 11, you will find that it clearly indicates that he had been dead long enough that in the heat of that Middle Eastern sun, his body had already begun to putrefy. And yet here he is, alive and healthy and in their midst. And so, no doubt, as they look around the room, they, they constantly look in amazement at Lazarus. This meal is 
been thrown as a celebration, provided as a celebration in Bethany, a celebration of Lazarus being raised from the dead, and also a celebration of thanksgiving to Jesus. It is obvious when you read the three accounts that Jesus is, as you would expect, the guest of honor. An interesting thing about this passage is that it says that it was held in the house of one Simon, a leper from Bethany. Now that causes many people to think that this Simon the leper was the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and that they were three rather young single adults who were still living in their home, their father's home, which no doubt was a grand home, a place where the disciples often stayed when they traveled to Jerusalem. Some have said that there's no reason to believe that this house was the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I'm not sure that it's important, but that they rather had offered their home, for many were celebrating what had happened in the life of Lazarus, and Martha would serve, even though perhaps it was not her house. It really doesn't matter that much. The important thing here is that this is a great celebration of thanksgiving. The gift that Mary gives, this precious Ointment, pure nard, the scripture says, which she has probably broken the thin neck off the bottle. That's the way they would sometimes open it, just break it open. And she has emptied its contents on Jesus. If you look at Matthew's account and Mark's account, it's obvious that she first pours some of the ointment on his head. And when you look at John's account, it's obvious that she then anoints his feet. But this particular Perfume was worth 300 days wages. Now, will you do a little math in your head? Have you ever actually thought about how much you make a day? And have you ever thought about the work week? The work week for some is five days. For others, it's six days. Uh, For other people nowadays, it's four days and some perhaps even less. But whatever a day's wages is for you, multiply that by 300 And think about what number you come up with. This was a scandalous thing for Mary to do. To empty out tens of thousands of dollars worth of perfume on Jesus there at that meal. I say scandalous in the sense that no wonder the disciples when they saw it must have caught their breath. Somehow knowing the value of it. Perhaps it was a family heirloom of some kind that she had taken from a treasured location and would now offer to Jesus. Martha gave a gift too. She served the meal. It leads me to think about the song that Ruffy played for us last week, My Tribute by Andre Crouch. How can I say thanks? You know, it's too easy to say thanks. Thanks is something that needs to be lived out. Thanks is something that needs to be demonstrated by choices that we make, by sacrifices that come from our life. We can sacrifice our time or our treasure. We can sacrifice our future in some extent. In other words, give up our plans and surrender instead to God's plans. But always our thanksgiving to the Lord needs to be sacrificial. Mary understood that. She recognized that her thanks needed to be extravagant, and indeed it was. But I want to tell you that extravagant thanks, loving extravagant thanks, makes people uncomfortable. It always makes other people uncomfortable when you pour yourself out in service to the Lord. I remember a young lady years ago who felt God's call to world missions. Now, this is many churches ago, but her mother was the president of the Women's Missionary Union in our church. Her father rarely came, but her mother was very interested in praying for missionaries, giving money to support missionaries. She would take the lead every year in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. But when her daughter made a decision... To lay her future on the altar and say, I will go to the ends of the earth at great personal risk and give my life to tell others about Jesus. Her mother wanted me to talk her out of it. You see what I mean? Sacrifice 
makes people uncomfortable. And indeed, it made not only Judas uncomfortable. If you look at the three accounts you'll find in John's account, it is Judas who says, why this waste? But it's obvious that in Matthew and Mark's account, the other disciples chimed in. Yeah, why this waste? Why this waste? They joined in the chorus of Judas's objection to the expense and the value of this costly ointment that Mary is lavishing upon Jesus. It made them very uncomfortable. I want you to notice how Jesus responds. There's always somebody that's telling someone else that they ought not to spend so much on something that has to do with the Lord. Sometimes it's a building. You know, sometimes it's, it's a fixture in a building. But someone is always suggesting that something is just too expensive and it should be used otherwise. That is exactly what Judas, leading the group, and the disciples were saying in response to Mary's loving extravagance as she gave thanks to Jesus. Jesus answered her in three ways. The first thing He said was, you will not always have me. You'll always have the poor. That's the second thing. But you will not always have me. There was a window of opportunity here that stood before Mary. An opportunity to show the depth of her devotion and the great treasure that she considered Jesus to be. Not to treasure the heirloom, if indeed that's what it was, but rather to treasure the Savior, the Lord Jesus. And to give up that which had been long saved by the family in order to express profusely love and grace and kindness toward Jesus. She realized that the window was closing. For even as they gathered there in a Thanksgiving celebration, others were gathering in Jerusalem plotting the death of Jesus. And no doubt that story had already gotten back to them. The window was closing. And Mary seems to know it. You'll always have the poor. That's an interesting thing Jesus said. He always cared about the poor. He began the Beatitudes by saying, Blessed are the poor. And we had to add, and in spirit, you know, so we can kind of deal with it. But if you look at Luke's account, he just said, Blessed are the poor. And when we look at the things that Jesus said about the poor, we're almost shocked that He would say on this occasion, well, you're always going to have the poor. But you have to understand, Jesus sees right through Judas. And Judas has his eyes on money, while Mary has her eyes on the Master. You see, it matters most where your eyes are. And if your eyes are on the Lord, no sacrifice is too great. For He is worthy of our best, always. The best of everything we are and the best of everything that we have. And so Jesus, in saying you will always have the poor, is saying you'll have numerous opportunities to be a blessing to those in need. But He's also saying, that's really not your problem, is it, Judas? That's really not your problem, is it? disciples. You talk about the poor, but that's really not your problem. Some years ago, we came back from South Mexico. In fact, Phil went on the second trip to South Mexico, and I had a burden on my heart about a pastor who literally lived in the church with his family. He had no home. Uh, he could not raise any crops, as most people in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico do. In their yards, they would raise some things just to get by somehow to survive. He carried his whole family on one motorcycle. You should have seen them piled all over that motorcycle when they would go from place to place. So I came back to our West Texas church, and I said, I have a vision that we raise the money here at our church to provide a home for Pastor Transito Us Munoz, that was his name. Well, I began to challenge the people about that. It was only going to cost us, now listen, you got your ears on? <laughs> it was only going to cost us $2,000. $2,000, we could buy a piece of land and build the man a house for $2,000. 
Do you know that members of the church started to object? Why is that such a worthy cause? Why, there are lots of pastors right here in the United States that need help. You know, and finally I stood before them. You have to understand, people, I'm not afraid of you. (laughs) Have you figured that out yet? I stood before them in a worship service and I said, if you don't want to give, don't give. Just don't give. But don't destroy my joy and the joy of others who want to give by standing in the way of what we want to do to bless the work of the Lord in South Mexico. We raised the money that day. And we're able to provide the land and the house. Jesus is saying to them, the problem really isn't the poor, is it? The problem is that you're still thinking too much about money. You're still too focused on the value of things. You know the value of everything but the worth of nothing. And so there is a gentle rebuke in what Jesus said. And the third thing he said was, this is for my burial. Somehow Mary saw what was coming. And though it isn't spelled out, she is anointing Jesus just as you would anoint a precious loved one after their death. That opportunity would not be hers or anyone else's. It would fall to two who barely knew him, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, to in any sense prepare his body for burial after the cross. But here in advance, Mary, in loving service, is anointing Jesus with a salve worthy of the greatest kings of the earth in preparation for His sacrifice on the cross and His burial. That's love's extravagant things. But you know what? Also, when I look at this story, I'm looking at love's humble things. Her actions are the actions of a common household servant. No doubt this family is a rather wealthy family and seemingly walks in the circles of wealthy families. It seems that Bethany may have been one of the original burbs, the suburbs of Jerusalem. And there were people there who had some means, such as Mary's family. But she is behaving like you would expect a servant to behave in anointing Jesus' head and foot. Particularly... When she begins to anoint his feet, as John records, she wipes his feet with her hair. Have you ever noticed that Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen 15, that a woman's hair is the glory of a woman? What is Jesus experiencing here? And what is Mary saying as she wipes his feet with her hair? No doubt wiping away the dust and, and, and pushing in the ointment into his feet. What is she saying? She's saying, I will gladly offer my hair as a rag with which to wipe your feet. It makes me think of John the Baptist, who when he spoke about the coming of Jesus after his ministry, he said, I'm not worthy to sit down and unloosen his sandals. We might say, I'm not worthy to untie his shoelaces. Mary is saying the same kind of thing. She is saying that She is not too dignified to do what she's doing. She is not too important to do what she's doing. And she is not too busy to do what she's doing. I think a great deal of the things that are not done for the Lord or in the name of the Lord are done because of dignity, self-importance, and just too busy. Just too busy. How we need to think about Mary's example and her humble thanks expressed in love toward Jesus. And finally, I want to talk to you for a few moments today about love's emboldened thanks. You have to understand the pressure Mary is under. In fact, a woman stepping out into this crowd and behaving as she did would sometimes be regarded as behaving in a virtually immoral manner. I mean, that's pretty amazing stuff when you start wiping somebody's feet with your hair. 
it would have looked rather strange, especially to those who did not know as well the relationship that Jesus had with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Mary is always at Jesus' feet. She's at His feet when He's teaching. She's at His feet in her sorrow when Lazarus is dead. And now she's at His feet in her service. But they might not have known that. But, but Mary is willing to face all of that pressure. She's willing to face the disdain of Judas and for that matter the other disciples when they say, why this waste? She's able to face that criticism. And listen to me, when you get serious about serving Jesus, when you get ready to begin sacrificing to serve Him, somebody is going to criticize you. Always. Don't just say sometimes. Always someone is going to criticize you. Why? Because it makes them uncomfortable. I cannot count the number of young people over the years that I've seen come to Christ only to have their parents fight me about helping them follow Jesus in baptism. Why? Because it makes them uncomfortable. It says to them, do I need to do something? Is my child ahead of me in this? And certainly she faced that pressure. She faced the pressure of pride, of of being able to humble herself, and she seemed to do it effortlessly. And she faced the pressure of time. You know what most of us think? We think we've got plenty of time. Oh, I really ought to do more for the Lord. You know, I've I've heard that so many times over the years. I really need, I really ought to do more for the Lord, but I'm just too busy right now. We're saying that our time is more precious than Jesus is when we respond in that way. And overcoming all of those obstacles, knowing that she had a window of opportunity, Mary gave us a beautiful example of loving, humble, and bold thankfulness. I was thinking about that matter of getting past ourselves and humbling ourselves and being obedient to the Lord and been teaching this church history course and it called to mind a preacher of England named Rowland Hill. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not, but Rowland Hill was one of the great preacher evangelists of England uh, in the early 1800s. Rowland Hill preached out of doors in parks in England, as so many did in those days. Wesley did that. Whitfield did that. Later, uh, Moody would do that. Occasionally, C.H. Spurgeon would preach out of doors. And Rowland Hill was preaching out of doors from a platform erected in a park. And a great crowd gathered around him. And Lady Erskine, Lady Anne Erskine, of English nobility came riding by in her carriage and said, Who is that man speaking? And the carriage driver said, Why, that's Rowland Hill. And she said, I've heard a lot about him. Pull the carriage close so that I can listen out the window. So she began to listen out the window. Well, Rowland Hill turned to someone on the platform and said, Whose carriage is that? Someone recognized it and said, Why, that's Lady Anne Erskine. And Rowland Hill said, Folks, I need to interrupt my message. I have something to be sold here today. Can you imagine the shock? (laughs) What's he going to sell? Some cynic in the crowd probably thought, Oh, well, that's why he got us here. He wants to sell us something. He said, What I want to sell today is the soul of Lady Anne Erskine. What is that? I hear a bid. Satan bids a life of pleasure, a life filled with comfort and ease. I hear another bid. The Lord bids peace, joy, everlasting life. And Lady Ann Erskine came out of her carriage weeping and gave her life to Jesus Christ. Sometimes we're just not thinking clearly. If we were truly looking at Jesus, 
nothing would hinder us. And no sacrifice would be too great. Let's stand together. Pray with me. Father, I pray that we would be motivated, myself and all these here gathered would be motivated, Lord, not to just say thanks, but to live our thanks in meaningful, tangible ways that would show, Lord, your great worth to us and the great worth attached to what you have done for us in dying on the cross and opening the door to everlasting life to us. Help us, Lord, to truly be devoted, to truly be loving, to truly be thankful. For we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.